it's hard to uh, get rid of uh, technology that runs your business. The hybrid reality is going to be here for a really long time. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are back again for another episode of The Download. We are excited about this one. Uh, we've got a, a guest of honor joining us from uh, Mexico and uh, excited to introduce him in just a moment. But uh, until then, my name is Jake Sherrill. I'm the founder and chairman of Tier 4 Advisors, and this is The Download Podcast brought to you live from Tier 4 Advisors HQ. The Download. Just north of Atlanta, Georgia in Alpharetta, Georgia. And mm -hmm. I'm joined by our VP of Marketing, Joel Anderson, yet again. Joel, thanks for being here. Oh, always a pleasure. Always. <laughs> great great to have you. Um, the purpose of the Download Podcast is to introduce all of our uh, listeners and watching uh, crew uh, to lots of different technologists, uh, visionaries, um, professionals within the IT space. Also talk about different strategies and ideas in not only the procurement of different services like data center, cloud, telecom managed services, but also, you know, talk about what maybe could be done better, um, what could be done differently. Indeed. Um, some Challenge new ideas. the status quo. Challenge the status quo. I like that. I like that. That's perfect. <laughs> uh, and, and great segue into uh, introducing ourselves uh, to the crowd. So why don't I go ahead and start with our, um, our, our attendee of honor, our, uh, our, our friend Sean Mills, the founder and CEO of Lunavi. Sean, say hi to the group. Well, hello, everybody. It's great to be here. Thanks, Jake. Absolutely. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and about your company there, Sean? So my name is Sean Mills. I'm the founder and president of Lunavi. We were founded about, uh, I guess it's almost 13 years ago now, uh, as a data center managed services company. And over the last 13 years, we've really kind of morphed just as you guys have seen the technology space. We've continued to uh, adapt our go-to-market strategy as our clients have uh, asked us to. And so, you know, we, we're now able to take, you know, our customers on their IT journey, whether they're starting in a new data center co-location facility, all the way to, you know, helping them innovate inside of the cloud and building new custom apps to really drive ROI and business value for their, their businesses. And so it's pretty cool seeing the industry change over the last 13 years. And I'm pretty excited about what the next 13 will hold as well. Absolutely. One of our best partners in our network. Uh, we've done a lot of different projects with Lunavi and uh, certainly value your partnership and thank you for that. Yeah, great folks over there. Absolutely. Great to work stuff. with. Joel, introduce yourself to the group. Sure. VP of marketing here at Tier 4. And if I can, can I tell a little bit about Tier 4 Advisors? Oh, Is sure, that okay. all right? Oh, sure. Might as well. Here we go. Tier 4 Advisors, founded on the premise of helping IT professionals simplify and expedite procurement, helping to find the right service providers at the right price. Was that smooth? Was that good? That was good. Specifically around data center, telecom, managed services, security and compliance, and other emerging technologies. And the way that we do all that is over the past eight years, we've built a vendor database of over 700 plus vendors, one of them being Lunavi. CIOs, CTOs, directors of IT, VPs of infrastructure, procurement teams. No more writing RFPs, no more endlessly researching which vendors do what, no more discovery call 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, because everybody loves those, right? All of that is gone. Those days are gone when you use Tier 4. So check us out. That was pretty good, Sean. What did you think? <laughs> Man, I give it an A+. Plus. Hey, hey, there <laughs> we go. that before? Maybe once or twice in the mirror. <laughs> <you know? laughs> That's why we pay him the big bucks. Exactly. VP of marketing, right? The messaging. <laughs> Uh, very, very good communication. Thank you for that. Uh, so let's go ahead and get into this, Sean, shall we? Uh, we're going to do a couple of rapid fire Q&A, uh, a little bit of a session here. So, you know, we always like to ask our um, guests of honor, you know, some different things about them, give the uh, audience an idea of who they are, what they've done, some of the experiences that, you know, they've had. So love to hear from you. Obviously, you're a successful technologist and entrepreneur uh, here at Lunavi, but tell us a little bit about your first J-O-B. What was your first J-O-B that you ever had, received a paycheck for doing what? That is such a fun uh, trip down memory, memory lane, thinking about the first job that you uh, had and how nervous you were starting it. So my first job was at, at working at a movie theater. I was the guy that popped the popcorn. Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> Started way high in my career and have gone nowhere since. Uh, <laughs> but it's pretty hilarious when you think about that. And I just remember as I was, you know, popping the popcorn, there was the position, the person that got to run 
uh, the movies. I was like, God, if I could only one day, one day be the guy that actually controls uh, playing the movies because that person was in charge uh, after the managers were gone. And so it was like, I want to be there. And well, you know, six months later, there I was and uh, <laughs> no longer popping popcorn, but made sure I could bring the greatest movies to you. Enjoy the movie at your <laughs> That's cool. So you're running from theater to theater, stringing the film, <laughs> making sure that the spools were all rewound or what have you and, and taking care of business. Yeah, absolutely. Good stuff. Absolutely. Good stuff. So, so how did you go from being the popcorn guy to the movie reel guy to then getting into IT? What was that transition like? And was it a, I mean, what happened? Right. Got an IT black eye. There you uh, go. No. So, you know, it's funny from, from 14, you know, being in the, in the movie business, let's just call it the movie business. Sure. You're a movie uh, star is what we can call it. Yeah. Uh, I had a quite the windy path. So I started off at uh, the University of Texas, majored in finance, went down the investment banking path, lived in London, San Francisco, uh, Dallas, and then finally started my first voiceover IP company. And it was um, Joel in marketing. You know, I was the VP of marketing. And, and so um, that as a marketeer in technology was really my first foray into jumping into the technology arena. And it all really came from a finance background. So I was super analytical, constantly looking at metrics, making sure spending the right amount of money, getting the right ROI. Um, definitely didn't grow up in the, the um, fluffy side of marketing. It's way more on the analytical side. And then uh, ended up starting a voice over IP company out of Dallas, sold it to a company in New York. And then uh, after that transition, I really started looking at, all right, if I'm going to go down, continue down this entrepreneurial path. I want to do it from a place that I'd really like to live. So moved to Denver, Jackson Hole, Sydney, Australia, really uh, having a great time, you know, dabbling in technology. And then it was as I came back from, from Sydney, uh, my wife and I settled down in Denver and we started up um, the origination of Lunavi, which in, at the time was a company called Greenhouse Data. Pretty good, uh, pretty good path there, man. Well, and I think about now, like, <laughs> I think maybe you and I were chatting about this the other day. I mean, this is, I've been now in the same place 20 years and it's like, man, I can't believe I've actually sat still for that long in one <laughs> location. So you've lived in a lot of different places. What was your favorite city to live in? So it's interesting. Uh, the thing that really pops into my mind, like just the first thing that pops into my mind is Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Mm -hmm. And it is so, it, 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 I was actually fearful of moving there because I'd never, all the cities I named were multi-million person cities. And then you land squarely in this place called Jackson Hole, 11,000 people, you know, an hour and a half to Home Depot. Like it, it, it's not the most near to the, um, normal amenities that you might think and you know so you're worried hey i'm living in this tiny town you know is this going to be like weird am i going to see everybody every day and it turned out to be an amazing experience with you know everybody loves skiing they love mountain biking they love kayaking all the things i love to do and it's like this little great restaurants you know right at the base of the tetons an amazing place certainly would probably call that my top um, lifestyle place to live yeah good for you I will say uh, just a quick shout out because I feel the same way about Charleston, South Carolina. I'm from California. Charleston, South Carolina is a city that a lot of people have never traveled to or experienced. Do not sleep on that town. It is uh, an amazing town, except for in the middle of the summer. It's a little bit hot and thick, uh, sweaty, but uh, what a great spot to go to. A lot of Southern charm there. Oh, my word. Went there for the first time last year, and it was pleasantly surprising. Lots amazing of, town. Lots of Southern charm. In that yeah. low country. Yep. <laughs> yep. So with that said, we want to keep moving. Uh, your greatest professional accomplishment, obviously being an entrepreneur, having a successful business, you guys have, you guys have gone through some different uh, acquisitions and things. You got a lot of amazing employees who we've had a chance to work with over the years. What would you say your greatest professional accomplishment would be? You know, it's funny. Um, a lot of times people think, oh, I bet you're going to say starting your company or the success of your company. And as I think about, you know, 
what would be my greatest professional accomplishment? Ultimately, it's, you know, as you've mentioned, Jake, it's the team that I've built, the team that, that I surround myself with that comes to work, heads down every day, focused on our customers, you know, focused on their success, building, you know, value for them, you know, putting together a great leadership and a great team around me to help support me because goodness knows I'm not the smartest tool in the shed, uh, but it's great to see how intelligent and exciting and passionate my team is. And by far the greatest accomplishment is putting that together. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. As, as a leader, you're only as good as the team that you build, right? And if you're looking to scale a business. When I think about, um, you know, what are, when I think about people being entrepreneurs, you, oftentimes you hear, oh, I can't go on vacation. I can't leave. I can't do this. And, you know, from the second I started the company, I wanted to make sure that I built a business that, you know, would run very smoothly if in the event I was no longer a part of it. You know, it's, it's about building something bigger than any one person. And that was one of my big focuses, you know, from day one. Absolutely. You bet. Obviously, as an entrepreneur, you go through a lot of different challenges. Uh, it, you know, uh, employees, managers, directors, VPs, all the way up, they go through challenges nonetheless. But, you know, talk about a little bit of a, uh, a challenge that you went through in your career and how you overcame it and, and why you're stronger on the other side. Absolutely. So when I think back of, you know, starting a business and, you know, as you continue to morph through the, you know, startup stage to the growth stage and becoming a mature company, understanding where your skill sets end and it's time to bring in better, greater quality skill sets was really a challenge in early in my uh, career to know, hey, look, I can't handle HR any longer. I can't handle being the CFO or handling the financial roles. Knowing where your skills end and where somebody else's begin has just been a, 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 you know, it was an early challenge and been a huge benefit once you figure out when to make those, those right hires and those key hires. Absolutely. That's good stuff. Joel, should we uh, keep moving on? Let's do it. Best all thing right. we saw all week? Let's do it. So maybe the best thing that happened to me all week is what I'll say. So we took the travel trailer out this last weekend, first one of the season, had the family out. It was beautiful weekend. All right. Uh, kids are in bed, wife's inside, kind of just relaxing throughout the evening. I go outside and, and have the campfire there. My next door neighbor, nicest guy in the world, comes over. At the over, campground. At the campground. Okay, next door neighbor. He, yeah, ne sorry, next, next, next door camping neighbor, comes over, <laughs> sits down. We chat for an hour and a half, camp, like Random fireside. Random stranger. Random stranger, the nicest guy you would ever meet. It just put like a restoration of that faith in humanity back in me. Here's mm. this like just random neighbor comes over. We're shooting the bull. I'm drinking my Pepsi. He's drinking his Coors Light or whatever. We're talking about work, talking about family, talking about camping, talking about cars. Like, it was a great, like I left that conversation like feeling refreshed good. and feeling good. I felt like it was, it was awesome. So that was the best thing that happened to me all week, but it was great. That's great. Yeah. Good stuff. Sean, how about yourself? Uh, obviously, you're you're traveling and whatnot. What's the best thing you've seen or had happened to you all week? <laughs> well, I would certainly be remiss in saying that uh, celebrating my wife's forty uh, seventh birthday in uh, Mexico would definitely be the best thing that happened uh, to me over the last week. And you know, I <laughs> I also had the fortune. And this comes down from the best to like. Okay, here. But uh, I started taking uh, my first business trips. I got to go visit with some partners, got to go visit with customers, had a you know, first C CIO and CTO face-to-face -face meetings, and that was amazingly refreshing uh, given you know, where we've been over this last year. So super exciting. On both of those, clearly way up here with my wife. <laughs> little bit Absolutely. Little. Nice. Uh, best thing I saw a week was actually an article online. So uh, it comes from a, a very negative thing, but obviously the colonial pipeline hack uh, that took place. Um, it, it seems like some of the folks uh, in D.C. are starting to pay a little bit more attention to this. Uh, there's going to be some uh, rules and regulations coming out for uh, protecting, hopefully more so, uh, some of the pipelines. And, and hopefully they're starting to pay attention to more so some of the mission critical data centers and, and some of the other things uh, around the power grid and, and things that make America, in some cases, America, right? Uh, and so I think that this, uh, as I heard one CISO say a few weeks ago, the phone has been ringing for years in, in the sense of like, should we call 911 about this? And he, he referenced the fact that the phone has been ringing for years regarding security and compliance concerns. Um, I, my hope is that not necessarily I want 
I don't want more regulation and, and more laws and, and, and that, but I would like to see some things get better. Again, at the end of the day, hopefully it is uh, something that helps protect the good guys from the bad guys. Yeah, because it brings about positive change, and hopefully that's the end goal there. Well, it's ultimately Lots. unfortunate, right, Like that you have to have an event like that that yeah. impacts thousands, millions of people millions, uh, yeah. and uh, to, to really bring that to light. It really is. Interesting stuff. So hopefully that's a good thing uh, as this podcast ages online. We'll there, see. There you go. <laughs> well, while we have two of um, some unique individual business savvy folks as yourself here on the podcast, I'd love to ask you both a couple questions around the, the pros and cons of founding a business and then that next stage of then running the business and then that even further stage of then continuously growing the business. So from, from a founding standpoint, I mean, you know, you, uh, Sean, you've gone through this a couple of times. Same thing with Jake as well, a couple of different business ventures. You know, so, some, talk to some of the pros and cons of founding a business and why that's great and why it's also a, a headache sometimes. Well, happy to do that. You know, I think about the early days of founding a business and you pretty much are doing it all right. you you are scrapping, you are understanding and learning, uh, you know, everything about the business that you're trying to start. And so the amount of learning that happens at the early stages and, you know, quite frankly, the number of times you're told, no, that's a dumb idea. It'll never work. Yeah. You need to be pretty resilient. And, and, you know, I talked to tons of people that want to start a business and the first question I asked them, is how long are you going to put the effort into this? Because, you know, almost everybody's like, oh, I want to go start this business. Uh, and then they're like, yeah, that was a good idea, but somebody told me no, and I'm going to move on to something else. It's like, mm -hmm. it's, it's hard. You got to be focused. Yeah. Jake? So, it, you know, when you found a business, it's usually because you have a dream or a goal or you're pretty good at doing something, right? So let's, you know, I, I'm a really good plumber. And I could probably do just as good or better of a job if I ran my own plumbing business as working as a plumber for another business. So it's always interesting to see, you know, rarely do people found a business because they just want to own a business. They're usually pretty good at something. And, you know, it, it's always fun to be kind of that, uh, that, that trailblazer in the sense of like, you know, driving that thing forward to begin with. Um, it, you know, it, it's sometimes a little bit of a challenge, depending on if you're bootstrapping or you're going out and trying to raise money right away, um, finding your own clients or customers, um, seeing if, in fact, your product or your offering can can be adopted or sell or people want to buy it or use it sure. uh, is always fun. So, um, you know, high level, it's uh, it's one of those things that, you know, if you don't if you haven't done it yet, you might want to try it one of these days because uh, it's hard to know what it's like until you do it. There you go. What is one? Of, what would what would be one of the things you would have changed early on in the founding stage? That's a great question. I, I, you know, I think there's a um, a position you get at where, and you already touched on this a little bit, but you know, you can't do everything once you get to a certain size. But hiring that first employee is nerve wracking, right? You've gone from an idea to a business where it's like, can this thing survive, and can I pay rent and actually put food on the table? to, okay, now it's actually working. Uh, now we've got to hire some people. And I probably would have done that sooner because uh, doing that was a, a risk. It was a little bit of a challenge, you know, because I bootstrapped um, the, my primary business uh, on credit cards. And uh, that first year, you know, putting thousands and thousands of, money, of dollars on credit cards and having a couple hundred bucks in the bank for Christmas with kids and things like that, uh, but getting through that and, and, you know, hiring folks and things, I probably would have done it uh, a little bit sooner than I did. How about yourself? It's, fun, it's funny you mentioned that because that, that's exactly my answer. And, you know, I, I would even take it one step further. And it's specifically hiring a growth oriented, you know, sales organization more quickly instead of, you know, making sure that we got traction. I think I probably have invested a little faster in, in in a larger sales organization. Yeah. So you guys both hit on that, that I guess we answered all three, the founding, the running, the growing, all kind of in there. I'd like to talk a little bit about um, the investments and the, also the rebrand that happened with uh, Lunavi over the past uh, year or two, going from greenhouse data to Lunavi. 
Sean, what um, inspired that? What brought that about? And I guess, you know, walk us through the Lunavi concept and what that means for those that might not be familiar with the new, uh, you know, greenhouse data transition into Lunavi. Absolutely. No. So uh, Lunavi really stands for illuminating and navigating. And so ultimately we help our clients navigate what's next on their IT journey. And so that's kind of the genesis of the name, but the name uh, really came from the formation of a couple of uh, uh, key companies. We, we uh, founded Greenhouse Data back in 2007. And along the way, we've acquired over seven companies over that 13-ish years, 15 years now. And, um, and you know, as you do that, you bring great people along with you. And it, at, at a point, it became apparent that the, the breadth of services that we offered you know, from the ability to help folks on their traditional IT, managed services, private cloud hosting business, to really now really innovating in, in the app development space and, and really building what is gonna make your company great, uh, the intellectual property behind your companies, we now have the ability to help clients do that. And that's on the custom app development side. And so it was really this two cultures of capabilities that needed to be merged and merging it behind one brand was really the thing that uh, drove us to look uh, to change the name and, and rebrand. You know, there, there's two great cultures that when they came together and could rally behind uh, uh, a single brand really brought a ton of value to our customers. Yeah. So you have more, more people, more resources, more capabilities. What does the next five years look like for Lunavi? So, I mean, right now, I mean, it feels like we're in a, in a time warp. Uh, the amount of investment that's really being made in the, in, in the modernizing technology, innovating technology, getting closer to your customers through technology, you know, building apps that, you know, you, you might have failed to continuously uh, innovate on and built up tech debt. We see a huge amount of benefit in, in our clients, you know, realizing that benefit now of investing in those applications. You know, the application is king. It has to run somewhere. Uh, it's running in a lot of places right now, but the, the fastest way to additional ROI for clients and driving great business value, we're seeing in, in the modernizing and using, you know, data to drive decisions, you know, bringing data into the applications to help make uh, decisions faster and better and pushing that data out to the customers to, for they, so that they can make decisions better and faster. You know, that's the wave we're riding right now. As you see the cloud continuing to progress down this path of what it is and what it will become, I mean, where do you see the need or niche of, you know, private cloud, virtual public, virtual private, dedicated private, uh, public hyperscalers. I mean, do you see eventually AWS taking over the world of cloud or do you always see, I mean, you know, three, five, 10 years down the road, um, you know, always this multi-cloud facet for, you know, legacy applications or whatever it might be? The hybrid reality is going to be here for a really long time. You know, it's hard to uh, get rid of uh, technology that runs your business how to it's hard and it's expensive to modernize that technology so you know that investment is going to continue to happen it's going to happen in the public cloud it's going to happen in private cloud it's going to happen in data centers and co-location because people can't just get rid of that tech debt that they had yeah yeah and as you see data centers continue to be built in every single market there is i mean one of the things that we're starting to see is you know or continuing to see i should say is you know 500,000 square foot data centers, million square foot data centers, things like that. Do you ever see a time, uh, you know, in the future where the data center footprint or square footage uh, shrinks? Or is this continuing to just explode with the public hyperscalers and the consumption of IT? You know, the hyperscalers are just continuing to explode. I think in, in our headquarters town in Cheyenne, Wyoming, you know, Microsoft set up a, a, I want to say a couple billion dollar data center there. They're about to double the footprint. And so these big hyperscalers are going to continue to grow rapidly. These massive data centers, you know, that are running really large organizations, you know, the Salesforce is, you know, the SaaS comp large SaaS companies the world, they're still going to continue to take up massive amounts of data center space. And, you know, really why we decided to, you know, as an organization, keep Colo continue to offer private cloud services and then really helping cl clients 
adopt and understand how to leverage things like Azure is because all, all of those will be in the mix for the near term. Unless you're built today, moving forward, your reality is gonna be leveraging the uh, components of all those things we just discussed. Yeah, and it's edge computing, uh, autonomous cars, um, you know, Starlink from SpaceX, 5G, 6G, 7G, whatever it's called tomorrow continues to evolve. Uh, safe to say that some of that data or all of that data will be going through some data center somewhere, right? I mean, that's just the reality. Yeah, absolutely. You know that you, you mentioned Starlink. I think that is going to be a fascinating endeavor that, you know, that there's really <laughs> the fact that someone's putting thousands and thousands of little satellites up in the sky, really with, you know, no defined business plan other than, hey, we're going to provide internet. I'm pretty certain the capabilities that that network is going to provide to us are uh, fully unknown by us at this point. I'm always fascinated that they called it Starlink instead of Skynet. Shout out to Terminator in case you've uh, seen that movie. Watch right? out. Skynet. Um, I mean, let's just talk real. I mean, the, the tracking, the data analytics, the everything, if you're connected to Skynet, I mean, Starlink, um, they're going to know everything about you, right? Be careful. I mean, it's here. It's here. You know, we just flew into Mexico and, and you walk in front of this TV screen that's, you know, it's taking your temperature, but it's also doing quite a few other things as you're walking, you know, it, it's analyzing who's coming in, who's leaving. So the, you know, the amount of data and the anonymity of that data doesn't exist. Nope, it doesn't. Whether you're driving your car and your license plates being scanned, pictures being taken as you're driving down through, you know, cameras, things like that. As soon as the analytics and things catch up with the machine learning, the artificial intelligence, you know, video surveillance is talking with other video surveillance and, and tracking everything else. I mean, it is what it is. I, I think if, you know, from a safety standpoint, it's probably a positive, but from a privacy standpoint, I think that's all, all null and void at this point. It really is. Right. So, so as one entrepreneur to another, Sean, I mean, as you look at, you know, what you've learned, what you've done. I mean, if you were to talk to yourself 20 years back, uh, the 20 year old younger Sean Mills, what would you be saying to him? And, 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 you know, what would you encourage him to maybe do uh, at that stage of your life? It's funny because when, when I think about, you know, what are the potholes that I've stepped in that I couldn't, I could have potentially missed, you know, early on, I surrounded myself with mentors uh, and, you know, folks that have, have been there and done that. I would say, you know, being more aggressive, even around, you know, building up a network of, of uh, mentors and friends and colleagues that you can really rely on and ask the questions to. Had I had that 20 years earlier, it would have been a totally different ball game. I mean, the stuff even still today that I face, you know, as you can, you know, we we're talking about founding, running, growing. The challenges at each of those stages just continue to get you're like oh i'm now in the just grow the the running stage or the growing stage this is going to be a lot easier <laughs> that actually never happens and so continuing to make sure you have a great network of folks that can help you you know minimize those uh potholes that you find along the way would, would is tremendously beneficial yeah you bet good stuff well, Sean, thanks so much for joining us. Joel, why don't we talk about some uh, VIP events upcoming, shall we? Yeah, of course. This last week, we had a great time at Atlanta National. Yeah, we did. Phenomenal weather. Shout out great to those attendees. who attended. Mm -hmm. Beautiful spot. And then uh, Dallas Cowboys Club, huh? So there we did Atlanta National on Wednesday. We did Dallas Cowboys Club on Friday. It was a busy week, but we had a lot of attendees. Thanks again to all those who came out. Hopefully, you really enjoyed yourself. Yep. Got a lot of birdies that day. Pray for birdies. A couple eagles. Nice. But then up on the radar, we have uh, June 4th in Dawsonville, Georgia, a uh, clay shoot happening this Friday. Uh, so if you'd like to join us, I think we have maybe one or two spots left. So a little plug there. And then June 11th in Nashville, Gaylord Springs uh, Golf Course. We have a, a great round, uh, best ball style scramble happening there as well. So looking forward to that. Tier4advisors.com slash events. These types of events, by the way, you know, we've been doing these now for six, seven years. The thought of these VIP events is it's different than a lunch and learn where you're going to come to uh, a steakhouse. We're going to feed you a steak sandwich and, you know, death by PowerPoint, right? So get out of the office, get out of the house, uh, a little bit more COVID friendly, COVID responsible, you know, uh, wear a mask if you want to, you don't have to shake hands, but 
if you can't socially distance on the golf cart uh, or or out shooting guns, I don't know that that there's much else uh, better in that sense. So, mm-hmm. spin the wheel. Let's spin that. Sean, we do a, uh, a segment every week of spinning the wheel and asking a random question. We landed on number Numero one. Uno. All right. So the question is, uh, do you have any talents? If so, what is your best talent? So obviously you're a talented entrepreneur. Uh, you're, you know, you got some, some other things that I'm sure you're talented in, but what is your best talent and why? What is it? Snowboarding would probably be my, my best talent. I don't know if it's my best right. talent thing I love doing the most, but uh, I don't mind jumping out of a helicopter skiing down some uh, crazy slopes. So uh, that is by far uh, one of the things I'm most passionate about. I, mean, I don't think I'd make the Olympics, but uh, it's pretty good. Good stuff. I like <laughs> nice. that. For those of you tuning in, uh, the, the term jumping out of a helicopter and riding a snowboard down a mountain is called helleboarding. Huh. Uh, or if you're skiing, it's called hella skiing uh, for those who didn't grow up around the mountain, uh, like some out here in the South. Joel, how about yourself? Uh, what is your best talent and why? I think I mentioned it briefly before that I am a FAA certified drone pilot mm. and I take great pride in my ability to capture great shots, uh, just buttery, smooth type shots where other folks may be a little bit uh, jaggedy, a little bit, um, not as smooth, I guess, as, as one would say. And like, I, I feel like I'm trying to be humble here, but like, I feel like I'm darn good at capturing some uh, beautiful drone shots. <laughs> so maybe for so those say, tuning that's my in, if, uh, if you need an aerial shot of your home or a <laughs> soccer practice of your kid, there or you, you want to, well, you know, watch yourself, walk your dog down the street, maybe Joel can come over and, and shoot that for you. Sure. Or if you got a boat and you want to go cruising on the lake, I will gladly come with you and I'll bring the drone. Good stuff. Get some buttery, smooth footage. Uh, a lot of people don't know this, but uh, I, I was a part of a couple long drive uh, contests when I lived out in the desert. And uh, I've been known to put the ball down the uh, fairway, uh, as well as put the ball OB quite a bit. Uh, but at least it's far OB. You know, it's, it's not a matter of if you're going to find it, because you ain't finding it. Uh, but I guess that's a talent that I've uh, been gifted with. But something that I take a lot of pride and I'm also humbled by is, you know, candidly being uh, given back to the community, whether that's doing mentorship in business uh, or coaching youth sports. Uh, I think that that's something that I've been blessed in the ability to help others and, and, and give back a little bit. So uh, hopefully those who are tuned in feel the same if I've uh, mentored or coached you in the past. So with that said, Sean, we greatly appreciate you joining us yes, for another episode of The Download. Uh, your insights, your expertise, your professionalism, as well as your partnership uh, is unmatched. So we really do truly appreciate your time. And uh, thanks again for coming. Absolutely. Thanks, guys. All right. We'll see you all next week. Next week on The Download. Thanks, everybody. Take care.